Have you ever noticed numbers in the Bible? Yeah, that's right, numbers. Numbers are important. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we take you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We do that every year. This is our 31st year, so welcome. Now, Corey and Ryan help us to understand better. So, Corey, what's going on? Well, I'm going to be taking a look at the strange incident um, that Numbers records of the bronze serpent. Ryan, what about you? Well, guys, I hope everyone's read Numbers 22 today because it's going to provide the context for my segment. And in this segment, I'm attempting to answer this question. Why was God angry with Balaam for going to Balak when it was God who gave him permission to go to him in the first place? All right. Very good. Janice? God cannot be tricked, fooled, or manipulated. All right. Let's open the Bible and look at what God is saying to us now. Numbers 23, verses 1 through 9. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. And God met Balaam, and he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars, and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. So he returned to him, and there he was, standing by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There, a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Numbers chapter 23, verses 1 through 9. Numbers chapter 21 to 24. This is absolutely amazing what we read today. We're going to focus in on just one particular place in this particular book of Numbers. And there are many prophets today who say they are speaking for God. But are they speaking only for themselves? False prophecy is a deep and dark pit. It is a trap that feeds us emotionally, but is terrible for us spiritually. Throughout the Bible, false prophets and prophecies are spoken against. The New Testament also rings the bell of warning in several locations. Say, let's take James chapter 3, verse 1 as an example. He says, quote, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Close quote. Now, in reading today, we learn about Balaam. While not an Israelite, Balaam was a man who heard God. Unfortunately, he really not was one of the many men or women outside of Israel who loved God. When God communicated to him, he would listen and obey to a point. Interestingly, the error of Balaam was not false teaching, but was something else which we will explore later on in the year. Now, this is fascinating because there's a lot of people who've said a lot of things. God told them this and God told them that and here God Hold on a minute. What did God really say? That's something that we have to ask ourselves as we think this through. Now, as we talk about false prophecies, there is no other question that we have to answer except what does God do with false prophets? And how are we to deal with this? Take your Bible guide and present it today and get to the reading. We're going to read Numbers chapter 23, 1 through 9. We're talking about Balaam. It's a great prophet, and this is a really 
interesting story. I remember when I was talking to someone, I said to him, listen, uh, you know, the donkey spoke to the prophet Balaam. And later on, he asked my friend, he said, did a donkey really speak in the Bible? <laughs> yes, actually he did. If you look at the Bible. So Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, help us to hear you. Help us to hear what you're saying and help us to know how you're saying it. Let's learn from the word of God, Father. Help us not to you know, listen to everybody else, but help us to listen to your word. That's what we need to listen to. Stop hearing all these other voices on social media and everything else, but listen to your word, Father. That's what we need to do. Amen. Now, as we focus on this, we are going to the first passage of scripture, which is chapter 23, verse one. And here is what it says. Then Balaam said to Balak, he was the king who hired Balaam. He said, build seven altars for me here and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Now that's interesting, isn't it? You see, the number seven was important to God. God rested on the seventh day. Seven was an important number. But listen carefully. I want you to hear me. We should hear the numbers, not worship them. We don't worship the numbers, but we hear them. God speaks through his word, and there are many numbers in his word. Seven is one of them. Eight is the number of Christ, but seven is one of them. We should hear the numbers, but not worship them. Very, very important. Well, let's get on because this gets better. Numbers chapter 23, verses two says, and Balak did just as Balaam had spoken and Balak uh, and, and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And then Balaam said to Balak, stand by your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. And God met Balaam and he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. And he said, return to Balak and thus you shall speak. So he returned to him and there he was standing by the burnt offering. He and all of the princes... Of Moab. Now, this is fascinating. I'll tell you right now. God responds to those who come to him. Now, Balaam went to God, okay? He didn't go to some other spirit. He went to God himself. You see, being a Christian or Christ follower is not to have some special communication with God, but to obey God, something that Balaam didn't often do, but obey God. Listen to the Lord. Hear him. What is he saying to us? And are we doing the things that he says? Now that's important to listen to today because there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians, but are they really doing what God has said? Something that we need to consider today. Well, we go back to Numbers chapter 23. Watch this. Numbers chapter 23, verse seven says, and he took up his oracle and he said, Balak, the king of Moab has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come and curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Oh my goodness, this is absolutely fascinating. You see, God's hand was on Israel. They were a people alone. God had called them out. And he would not let his people be cursed. No, because he called them out. The Lord is at work all the time and we should not get in his way. One of the things that Balaam never figured out was that God was doing something and he just was responding to Balak and all that stuff. But Balaam needed to hear what God was doing and he never asked. He just did what God said and he kept himself clear. Beloved, today we have a choice. Will we hear 
the word of God? Or will we hear what everybody else is saying? My question to you, who are you listening to? If you are listening to a man, then my question is you have to listen through the word of God. That's why this program takes you through the Bible. It is the most important book ever. You know, I don't have a book written. I mean, I will sometime, but I don't have a book written on this and that and the greatness of this ministry and all that. I have the Bible. I have word that points me to the word. I have a call to you that says, get in the Bible, get in the word, because that's God's word, beloved. He is speaking to us. He is talking to us. We must listen to the word of God. And here we see in the example of Balak, hiring Balaam and all of this going on, trying to curse Israel. But Balaam couldn't because God had not done that. God had set them out alone. He had anointed them or pulled them apart, if you would. They were not reckoning with the nations. They were not a part of some national tribe, a bunch of nations. But God brought them out and he said, they're alone. That's who I see. And God has not cursed those people, but God has blessed them. Beloved, when we come out and when we are alone and we serve God, then we are different. Then we change. Then things around us begin to change. Now, I know a big portion of our reading in Numbers, our assigned reading for Numbers today, had to do with Balaam, uh, the pagan prophet. Uh, but tucked away in Numbers chapter 21 is a small paragraph that talks about an incident uh, where the people of Israel got really, you know, they got really sick. And the way that they got healed from that was looking at a bronze serpent. What is that all about? We're going to find out. Take a look. In Numbers 21, we're briefly told about a dangerous, puzzling incident in Israel's history. During their time in the wilderness, the people are said to have grumbled against God and as a result, faced a sort of plague of poisonous snakes. With many people dying from snake bites, Moses asked God to intervene and was told to build a bronze snake, hoist it up on a pole for the bitten person to look at. That looking is said to have cured the infected individual. In the ancient world, snakes are known to have been seen as messengers of evil, ill will, or as a sign of being cursed. So these Hebrews would have naturally associated an outbreak of snake bites with a spiritual reality. In their case, it was their offense against God. Much later on in biblical history, we get help with interpreting the meaning of the bronze snake on a pole. In John 3, Jesus likens himself to that bronze snake, that he must be lifted up in the same way, that whoever sees and believes in him will be given life from God. In Moses' day then, we can assume that as the snake was a symbol of the sin of the Israelites, they needed to look at it in acknowledgement and believe that God would save them from that sin to be given earthly life. The bronze snake, also called Nehushtan, shows up again during the reign of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hezekiah was trying to get his people away from pagan practices and back to biblical worship of God. We are told how he removed high places of worship, shattered idols, and even destroyed the bronze snake, as the people had gotten into a habit of burning incense to it, which to Hezekiah was much too close to idolatry. Recently, it's also been noted by historians that perhaps Hezekiah had even more motivation in Nehushtan's destruction. Later on in his reign, Hezekiah came under the political authority of the Assyrian Empire, and they likely would not have appreciated any sort of imagery that looked close to the royal imagery of their large political rival, Egypt. Egypt. 
So this bronze snake or bronze serpent incident is a really good, um, you know, example of why it's important to do not only cultural background studies, but also follow through a topic in the scripture. Because when, you know, like many things, when Christians look back at the Old Testament through the filter of Jesus, we're able to see how Jesus fulfilled so many different kinds of uh, types and signs and prophecies. And, and this is, you know, one of those examples. But also in the time period of ancient Israel, it had meaning to them as well. Uh, and it's important for us to recognize that. And while, yes, seeing Jesus as a fulfillment of these signs and types, because that is valid, we read about it in the New Testament, also understanding how God was speaking to the ancient nation of Israel at that time has such tremendous value for us as Christians and as Bible students, uh, because then we're able to understand God's character and God's nature and how he interacts and responds and communicates to human nature as well. So uh, really interesting to be able to look at these issues in the Old Testament, uh, both from um, an intended meaning at that time and also then a symbolic meaning for Jesus Christ. You know, Corey, it's interesting because when you when you begin to talk about these sort of things, a lot of people look at the, the snakes upon the pole and all of that, and they see modern um, medicine and they see those uh, ideas and they think, oh, you know, Satan, Satan. But remember that it was God who told Moses, this is how you heal the people. So, and it later became a worship practice, but it's very interesting. And you look at the New Testament carefully. I think that's important. And you understand, you don't just, you read the, you read the Old Testament with the New Testament in mind. Very important. Okay. Ryan, uh, what in the world did you do, man? Well, you know, today our reading is Numbers 21 to 24, and so I'm focused specifically on chapter 22 because some people get really confused about what's going on here, especially in regard to God's anger towards Balaam. And I hope you've read it because if you have, it'll make this segment easier to follow. But in case you haven't, I'll just give you a really quick overview of the situation. See, in this chapter, Israel has set up camp in the plains of Moab. Well, the king of the Moabites, Balak, sees this, and he's naturally filled with dread, since the Israelites had just defeated their Amorite neighbors. So Balak decides to summon Balaam, a prophet whose blessings and curses on people seem to be effective. And not surprisingly, God doesn't give Balaam permission to go to Balak and curse Israel. But King Balak, you know, he's persistent, and he sends a second group of messengers to Balaam. But as he did with the first group of messengers, Balaam tells the men to stay the night so he can consult with God once more. This time, God's answer is different. He says, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. Then the Bible says, so Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. And then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now, this last part has confused a lot of people because it seems that God grants Balaam permission to go to Balak, but then gets angry with him for going. How do we resolve this apparent issue? Let's study. When prophets for hire Balaam is sought out by Balak, king of the Moabites, to come and curse Israel, God strictly forbids Balaam, saying, You shall not go with them, you shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. But Balak, desperate and refusing to give up, sends for him again. Balaam's response to the king's men is the same. You also stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. But this time the Lord's response is different. If the men come to call you, he says, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. With permission granted, the Bible says, So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with them. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. The big question that's often raised here is if God gave Balaam permission to go to Balak, then why was he angry with him for going? Actually, the solution is in the text itself. In fact, it hinges on the tiny two-letter word if in verse 20. It's very easy to read through God's instructions and miss the condition that he placed upon Balaam. Nevertheless, God's stipulation is, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. And in this, Balaam failed, because he did not wait to see if the men would return to him, but rather eagerly sought them out. Confusion can arise here if it is assumed that the men were staying in Balaam's own tent because it virtually voids God's condition in verse 20 
since their calling on him in the morning would be unavoidable. But in reality, with such a large entourage, there just wouldn't have been enough room for them in Balaam's tent. Thus, they likely stayed in a large camp with many tents. So Balaam knowingly disregarded God's explicit instruction. Even so, God's anger at Balaam was not only that he disobeyed, but also because of why he disobeyed. As Walter C. Kaiser Jr. points out, with King Balak's first inquiry, Balaam rightly replies that the Lord refused him permission to go with them to curse Israel. What Balaam had artfully neglected to mention was God's reason for refusing, because Israel is blessed. Mentioning this just might have ended the Moabites' attempts to curse a people God blessed. But Balaam apparently was playing both sides of the street on this one. He deliberately left the door open, perhaps hoping that he could somehow benefit from such a highly visible ministry. Both 2 Peter 2.15 and Jude 11 confirm that Balaam was a man who ran greedily for profit and loved the wages of unrighteousness. And this sinful lifestyle is what stirred up the holy and righteous and justified anger of God. So God gave Balaam a condition which he failed to meet. And that condition was, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. The problem is that in some versions of the Bible, this condition of God gets lost in translation because the word if has been changed to a different word. And this is where the confusion comes. But make no mistake, God does place a condition on Balaam here, and Balaam disobeys that condition. Balaam was more eager to make a profit than to serve God. And for his disobedience and love for unrighteous profit, God's anger was rightfully aroused. Yeah, very good, Ryan. Excellent work, uh, both Corey and Ryan. We are uh, on the 15th of January when we're taping this. So we're under the stay-at-home order in the province of Ontario, 15 million people. So that's why they're at home. So, But that's okay. We're just demonstrating that, yeah, we can do this. So that's good. Janice? Yep, we're still going to bring the Word of God to you every day. And we're thankful. We're thankful. Corey, I was thankful that in your segment, you talked about how that as Christians, when we read the New Testament, we can see how Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of the law of signs and different things. And yet God took the opportunity in those times to speak to the ancient nation of Israel and also to the nations surrounding them. That's what I really took a look at today as we were studying Numbers chapter 23. Uh, I'm always fascinated by Balaam and his escapades with uh, Balak and with his donkey. And Ryan, you touched on that today. Thank you for doing that. But not even a well-known pagan prophet of his time could manipulate the God of Israel with whatever he attempted to do. And I'm talking about Balaam. He was a well-known pagan prophet. And this the whole setup of the seven altars using the seven bulls and the seven and rams, that was a familiar Babylonian ritual to their gods. Even having Balak stand by the offering, as we read in, in this chapter, meant to have a proxy for the offerer. So here, Balaam was functioning as the priest and diviner on behalf of Balak, who stood by the offering made on behalf of the Moabite people. No matter what they offered up or what they conjured up, God would not allow his people to be cursed. Balaam had already told Balak Rod, he had already said to him, look, I, I, I'll do this for you, but whatever God speaks to me, that's what I'm going to have to say. And you can see the frustration of Balak when every time Balaam stood up, he was blessing Israel, not cursing him. Now, the gods of Mesopotamia were often seen as random and easily manipulated through sorcery and division. But God sets out his character here through Balaam's second oracle especially. I love this part. He says, God is not a man. So here uh, Balaam is, is proclaiming this over, the, over, over everything. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? And this is exactly the character of God. What God says, he will do. And that's our God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So don't ever mistake the God of the Bible as one who can be manipulated or tricked or fooled. And sadly, Rod, I, wanna, I just want to say, in today's culture, it seems as though there are a number of people who 
are believers who say that they are Christian, who follow after God, that somehow it seems as though they feel that evil triumphs over God, that somehow God can be manipulated by some sort of underlying conspiracy or something that's going on that perhaps God maybe is not aware of. And I just really want to remind all of us today that God is sovereign. God knows everything that is going on. God knows the heart of every single individual. That's why he tells us, don't judge by the outward appearance. That's not just how we dress or how we look, but how we act and, and respond because only God knows the heart. He's not surprised by anything that's going on. And what we need to do is to set ourselves behind the Lord Jesus Christ. God is our commander and we are his children. We are his army and we need to get behind him and follow his direction and his lead because he is God. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He always was and always will be. I think that's important to remember and to keep that in mind. And you know, God is not uh, wrapped up in conspiracy theories, but we do get wrapped up in them. But remember, Jesus is Lord. As we conclude the program today, we're going to pray. And we pray this way. We say, Lord, help me to learn that others are more important than my own ideas about the world, others. Get my mind wrapped around others because that's how you communicate to the world. You are concerned about others, what's happening in their lives. And may they come to you in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord. Amen.